Thank you, Rick. Um, what's, <laughs> what's, what's funny is I never have any idea what I'm going to say once I get up here, so let's just see how this all works out. And so I'm a Pacific Northwest native, kind of born and raised here, here with my family, my daughter is Italian, Jordan, and my wife, Lori. So we're all here as, as a family. I put this up here because this is where we live. And we're obviously down here, for those of you who aren't from the Northwest. But I wanted to start this with a video. And this is a lot about history. And I also wanted to say a big thanks to the Portman team that's here. Um, going back all the way to 1995, I did the original Land Rover Center training for the, for the group here in Portland. Dan Bookley, who's the center manager, has been an amazing individual. The whole Rasm Don Rasmussen group, of which Greg is still active with here, they're, I've been to and was involved with the first 100 Land Rover dealerships nationwide that transitioned into center status. Land Rover Portland is my, my favorite of all of them. So, round of applause for Land Rover Portland and the country of those things. So, with that, um, in 2014, Land Rover wanted to do a 25 year anniversary of Discovery. And there's a cool video out there. Some of you may have seen this. They didn't know how they were going to do it. And then they finally decided, let's see what the customers have done. So they solicited videos from you. And a thousand videos were sent out from 70 different countries. So we'll cue that video and kind of watch. It's a good, fun starting point to this. It's about five minutes. And just enjoy this, because it's a pretty cool clip. Thank <laughs> you. 
I'd be summoned there now. I need them who got to work this morning and bought this car. Well done, Dave. The disco. So, kind of a cool video, pretty much captures the spirit of adventure that Land Rover is all about, I think. So my journey actually started, and Mike's going to um, click my seat, my click slide clicker here. So my journey actually started quite a long time ago. Um, this is my first Jaguar, and the next slide is my first Land Rover. But I was six years old, and they were little matchbox. Uh, <laughs> so I actually fell in love with the brand not long ago. And here I am still playing with the same two brands uh, quite a while later. So go ahead and take that forward. So my first Land Rover that I actually ever owned was this vehicle, a 94 Defender. Technically it was a 93. It was one of the first five that Land Rover North America brought in when we brought Defender back in 1994. So these were used for pre-production as a prototype and it was used for all the press stuff that we did and the vehicle launches and training and all of that. Owned that for a number of years and then it transitioned to that vehicle which is out here in the parking lot. Um, owned that for about 23 years and it's been a pretty amazing and fun vehicle that I've really enjoyed over the years. Uh, this is my daughter here. Um, I got her started pretty young and you can see the shirt shirt there on her, on her back. So I remember in the Defender one time out off-road we were doing, doing our thing and she reaches up and she goes run a little bit of a side tilt. Careful daddy. <laughs> so, uh, good story there. All right. So what I do with JL, right? I've worked with Jaguar Land Rover now for 30 years. I've never been an employee. I've done it as, as a contract individual and it's been an amazing journey. I've worked with a lot of clubs and groups and individuals and done all of those things. I still do quite a bit, but I'm trying to tiptoe out the door, if you will. Uh, so doing less and less as time goes on. So jump forward. Where I really started with the brand was I read a little sidebar like this in a magazine because I grew up on the Olympic Peninsula and adventure was kind of everything. We grew up out in the country and I love adventure, which is what the Land Rover Brand's all about. Saw those little cars and the, the vehicles and the old Mutual of Omaha videos, Wild Kingdom, all of that stuff, and wanted to be part of that. And I responded to that and made the team. And so, good jump forward. U.S. trials in Colorado, from there made the final four and then went to went to forward to Terzi Dombron in Italy and which is the center of Italy for the international trials. Each of 18 countries would send four people to the international trials. And I felt like I just fell off a turnip truck showing up there because I'd never been to Italy, never been done any of this stuff, just a little country boy. And I was felt like I was really over my head, but an amazing experience, and go ahead and click. I ended up with a really good partner on the event. So, as most of you know, we don't live life alone. And this is the four of us that made it to the event. And as we go forward here, click forward. I'm moving fast here, so we got a lot of stuff to come really quick. There's where we stayed in Italy for this. And some of the things that we did there, um, there were a lot of different competitions that went for, for 72 hours pretty much straight around the clock. Just when you thought you would get to sleep, the next thing happened. And kind of a surprise with that. 
Um, there's my partner, Mike Hussey, and honestly, couldn't have had a better partner. He was a, a bigger part of the reason I'm here than the reason two of me wouldn't have done it, but two of Mike might have. So huge, huge part of our of our team. I have a lot of respect for Mike. I talked to him two days ago, so stayed in touch with him. 30 years later, we're still in touch and in contact. He lives in Middlebury, Vermont. Um, this is an interesting picture because there's the four of us training. After we did training in Colorado, we went to the UK. And if you look closely at the left side of this picture, <laughs> um, it's a double exposure. And I could have cropped that out, but I just left it in just for fun. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't created, it was just sort of random. I don't know why I got the double exposure and I was looking at that and thought, well that's pretty cool. Um, it's, so we went to Sabah, Malaysia. That's where my journey started. It was a, a two-week circumnavigation of the island state of Sabah, uh, which is a pretty amazing journey. They always start with some sort of ceremony where you meet the dignitaries of the country that come out, and there that is. And I apologize for all the pictures of me in there. Mike tried to find pictures of me on the internet. You won't find them. I've, I've really tried to maintain a low profile. This isn't something I'd like to do. I was asked to do this. I'm um, happy to share it with you, but it's kind of not who I am. I love, I love the autonomy of just having fun with friends and family going out and playing. So, um, still cool doing this. So, there's what we took with us. So all of that stuff fits in those pelican cases for two weeks. That's all of your food, all of your supplies, fuel, water, everything you need for two weeks. Your tent, your sleeping, everything for four people. Because once you start on the journey, you're out there. Every now and then you might touch a little village or something, but that's about it. There's not time to resupply or a way to do that. Um, Peter McGillivray on the right and John Phillips. So John Phillips was executive editor, editor of Car and Driver. Peter McGillivray, photographer and involved with Fort Wheeler Magazine at the time. They were our participating journalists. And we had two really good journeys. So without that, a lot of the countries didn't have that good journalists to really help them. So that helped us a lot. There's our vehicle. And there's what it looks like. When you get out there in the jungle, this was a dream come true to me. The sidebar that I read was something like, if laying on your back in the middle of the jungle, in the middle of the night, while muddy and hot and tired sounds like fun to you, you should apply. <laughs> so I, I did. And a couple more shots of the, of the jungle. At night, the jungle, right before dark, boy, does the jungle ever come alive. It is. It's a pretty cold place. So you can see this bridge and the really cool construction on it. Um, the first three days, two to three days, it's kind of a blur there, we rebuilt 25 bridges or bypassed or got through them because when they do the pre-scout on an event like this, they do it a year ahead of time. So things happen in between. Plus they look for challenges anyway. So there's the first bridge and there's the second bridge. So a lot of them look just like that. It's an aerial view. They did a lot of helicopter work on this. This is pre, this is 30 years ago. So this is pre-drone days. So there was helicopters, a helicopter involved with this. And there's what would happen is, it's a way to get 18 t international teams of two people working together. Half a camel trophy is team spirit. And that's, it's based on how much you do together as a team to get stuff done. You can't do this stuff by yourself. It, it takes a big group of people to do it. Sometimes you bypass the bridges, sometimes you dig through them. That last slide is digging through one. Sometimes your repair doesn't work so well. <laughs> and uh, you end up in a situation like that. 
and there's limited things to recover from often so you have to get creative in this case we had vehicle in front we got a vehicle on the other end pulled a tight cable and used that tight cable to pull sideways with sort of like logging from that cable that was stretched between two vehicles so lots of creative things that you can do this was a long ways down luckily this was a, a support vehicle that went over first sometimes the logs that you choose to repair the broken bridge with you shouldn't have chosen that log. Um, more of that, same stuff, lots of work during the first few days. And you'll note the shirt. Um, it's not raining there. Uh, the shirt's actually the same, just like this one, but it's hot, you're sweaty, you're tired. You just do what you have to do to get it done and working with a bunch of people. Back, once you get through this, back on the event. So during the event, there are things called special tasks. In the beginning, there's a competition that happens. In the middle, there's a competition that happens. And at the end. So part of the Camel Trophy is convoy phase and just getting there. So it's a big adventure. And then part of it's hard on competition. So, um, I showed this, that, this picture to Mike the other day. And uh, he said, Mike said to me, it looks like I'm doing a really great job and you're just cheering me on. And I, and I said to him, probably because I just gave you the tire because I was about ready to have a heart attack. <laughs> Mike is a former professional level cross country skier. And when we did the competitions, anything physical challenge, Mike kind of never got tired. He just kept going and going and going. He's like the Energizer Bunny. So he's pretty cool. Um, this is one of the special tasks in the middle of it. All sorts of things that they have you do. Bridge building, recovery, getting a transmission across the river without it getting in the water, uh, using your vehicle, and whatever resources or means. It's really left up to you to figure out how to do it. So it's kind of kind of fun. There's no way to prepare for this stuff. It's, it's really life experience that gets you prepared for it. Um, another shot of getting across. So the transmission wasn't supposed to get in the water. Uh, this team kind of got it there a little bit. This was also in one of the competition pieces of it, just a, a drive through on a slalom course, kind of a cool iconic shot. That one's made it in a lot of magazines and stuff over time. And this is one of the bridges that we had to build across a river and in one of the competitions versus the convoy portion. So we'd had a lot of practice prior to that. Those first three days, no sleep. Literally, we'd worked around the clock because each, every aspect of that thousand mile journey around Saba, we needed to be somewhere at a certain point. And if you're behind schedule, you keep going until it's time, to, you know, so you can get there on time. We made it across the bridge, so our team was the first. Also, there's a lot of luck, some luck involved. Depending on what teams you get paired up with on the event makes a big deal. So if you get paired up with a competitive team that works well together, everything goes better together. If you don't, then it's a little bit more of a challenge. So we, got, we were fortunate with there. The Spaniards in particular, we loved working with. Bright guys, hard working, good attitudes, a lot of fun. So the Spaniards were a lot of fun to work with. Um, the Dutch, on the other hand, <laughs> this vehicle um, was, a, was a rollover on the convoy portion of it. And I was actually involved with the repair on this. Some of my background includes mill riding and electrician. And I'd done a lot of weird welding on, in, in heavy industry in situations that normally don't happen. And the, there's, with the convoy, there's a group of support vehicles. There's a mechanical car, it's got a welder in it, but they never really welded something in those conditions. So literally I was laying on my back in the mud under this vehicle, welding the front differential. It had a hole knocked in it. And it's very thin metal. If you've ever done any of that kind of stuff, it's hard to do. 
and we did get the vehicle going again. They they kind of given up on it when we showed up, and we got it going again. So that was kind of kind of fun. But it, it did play a little role in that. Um, this vehicle was again the Dutch vehicle. You notice there's no windshield in it. So they eventually flew in a piece of plexiglass because there's torrential rains in, in Malaysia and they were wearing goggles and the rain was just literally pouring into the front of the vehicle with all of their stuff. So when they got the plexiglass windshield, they were pretty happy. We, in the middle of it, Camel Trophy always had done something to give something back to the country. So we went into what was called the Malio Basin, hiked into it about a day hike. It's a up into, it's called the Lost World there. And we hiked in, it hadn't been, it, no logging has happened there. And there's a lot of flora and fauna that really hadn't been mapped and, and uh, the whole area hadn't been really researched that much. So we built a research station there and we did that in 24 hours. They flew all of the materials in with a helicopter and all of the teams worked around the clock in shifts and built that the research station, which was kind of cool to give something back to the country. On the way out, it's not raining there either. So you can see kind of the, what happens with the humidity and the sweat and everything that happens. Remember, there's no showers with this. So you can imagine what the vehicle might start to smell like after a week or so of that. And there's how you get clean. If you find Clean of being a relative term. If you look at the water there, yeah. it's uh, brown, but it's a lot better than the sweat. So any opportunity that you have. You also get to rivers that you have to cross, and there are a couple of raft units that travel with the whole convoy. And they're pretty good size. It takes a while to assemble them. All of the, the teams work together to assemble them and then you put a vehicle on them and off you go if everything goes according to plan. It did, by the way, so that was good. Um, but you can see all the sand lighters that are on the vehicle. They were all taken off of all the competitor vehicles so we can literally sort of do a complete cover of the riverbank going down to it because it's just soft mud in a river like that. And that's what it looks like once you get a car on top on them. Pretty fun crossing in that. Who knew you could float a land over across a river, but it's pretty fun to do that. So this picture, Mike is a geologist by trade, and we saw this feature in Saba, and of course we had to have a little bit of fun with this. And that's what it actually looked like, but the previous slide we had a little fun with tipping the camera and making it, making it look like that. But pretty cool stuff. And again, I, hats off to Mike. There are also bugs there. Some of them are big, some are small. Some of them want to use your body as a host. Oh, great. And the, the, one of the, de or the uh, Swiss team actually got flown out with dengue fever while he was there, which can be fatal if it's not treated. Um, but a lot of the other bugs are just kind of cool and big, including that one. I've never seen a moth, anything like that moth. It's pretty, pretty cool. I think it's huge. It had giant wingspan. We did touch a couple of villages and had a little. Was prepared a little bit for that. Took some candy to give to the kids, so that was kind of fun to do on on the event as well. Toward the end of it. We had a, a journey where they put us on a, on a narrow gauge rail, all of the vehicles, and it took us to the kind of the ending where the final competition was for the event. And starting, we worked with the Spaniards on this one, getting our vehicle back up comp with competing. So two teams would work together, so teams of two, so four people and we were split up, and luckily, again, we got the Spaniards, and we, we smoked everybody on this event. It was pretty cool. They were awesome guys to work with. Another bridge that failed, um, 
the, the logs on the left went down, but we still actually made it across first place on this. We ended up having to winch it across. We didn't chose not to try to spin the tires or risk falling in, pulled a winch cable and eased it across the rest of the way. We won that competition as well. Nice. Kind of cool. Um, time speed distance. So rally driving, John Phillips was in the back. He did our timekeeping for us. And it's an exhaustive task. And you can see John here at, toward the end of that task. And that's what the back of the car looked like at, at the end of that. Remember, you're living in this vehicle for a couple of weeks. So you do the best you can with it. And you take any, every opportunity you can to kind of dry things out uh, because it rains a lot. Sometimes it's rained when it's time to put all your gear away, so it's soaking wet. You're up at 4 or 5 in the morning and all your gear soaking wet. My daughter, Jordan and Natalia, um, do a lot of tent camping and sometimes you have to put the tent away wet. And you know what this is. Probably a lot of you have done that too. I've seen some dormobiles out here. And, uh, Fun stuff. John was pretty tired by then. This slide is in there. You'll wonder why that's there. This was actually staged. This is in New York City on a, on a building, and this is not how the steel workers ate their lunch, but there were photographers there do, capturing the building during this time, and they staged this photo just like this photo was staged. So we're driving along, we're toward the end of the event, Mike and I are nice and dry, we're comfortable, and Peter says, Peter's the photographer from Four Wheeler, and he says, stop the car. We're going, what? And he says, you have to run through this because I want to get a shot of this. So from being nice and dry and comfortable to running through this so Peter could take this photo, that was staged as well. So if you ever see that photo, it's not real. Well, the photo's real, but the circumstances behind it weren't. So, um, at the end of the event also, kudos to, to John and uh, Peter McElroy. John had a great sense of humor. He's, I don't know if any of you have ever read his articles over the year, years in Car and Driver, but he's always got a great sense of humor. As he did at the end, Mike's duct taping him back together again. He's got his clothes all ripped. You'll see duct tape all over his shirt. Uh, having a little bit of fun with that. Uh, and Mike's basically walking away going... <laughs> so it's fun stuff there. There's Mike and I at the end of it, tired. Probably a little bit thinner than we were when we started two weeks ago. And the You Made It presentation when we finally made it out to the end. And then Michael and I, again, got pretty lucky. We won the event, and um, we're the only U.S. team to have done that. Tom Collins, who basically led the whole U.S. team, lost it on a coin toss. They had a tie, and they did a coin toss to determine the winner. So. In reality, we're not the only team to have ever won. I'd say Tom Collins and Tom and Don Floyd were too. So Tom did a great job. The whole U.S. team did a great job with training, and a lot of lot of uh, respect and admiration for that group of people. So um, there's the very end of it. Who knew where it could lead to? I've got a few slides I want to show from the next year. Just real quick, a uh, run through. So I know you don't want to hear me ramble on, but the next year was something pretty amazing. I drove support for. I was invited back to drive to help with the competitions and drive support for BHP Sport out of the UK. So I drove the video car, which is a whole different experience than competing. And so, oh, that was the kind of the end of that. It's the. Uh, this is Peter McGillivray's article, and I like what Michael said in here. Uh, if you have to ask, you'll never understand. Why would you want to do that? So I like what Mike said there. Yeah. So the next year, and I'll make this quick, I, but there's some cool images in here. Um, this is Iguazu Falls in Argentina. 
and it's not the tallest falls in the world, but it's one of the most spectacular ones. What you can't see here is it actually wraps around this way quite a ways also. And those are the, that's my video crew that I, that I drove with, Simon, Murray, and Alan. Simon is on the left, Murray's the sound guy, and Alan's the videographer, and Simon was the, the producer, if you will, for the, for the team. And so I drove the vehicle for these guys. They helped when they wanted to or could, but an amazing experience, some of the stuff that I'll share here. So this is stuff that didn't, don't really make the videos that you might see out there. There's a lot of stuff on YouTube, if anybody ever wants to, to dig in a little bit. But starting out in Paraguay, so it's that we started the journey and went out through the flats. This is how people were still living in 1993 out in Paraguay, and they still are today. A lot of that's happening. And just going out into the tracks toward Argentina, it's flat and muddy, and you start to see a little bit of that. Um, some of the camel trophies experienced a lot more mud than this, where 24 hours they'd make maybe a kilometer in 24 hours of all the teams lunching and working together, but we got through this pretty quickly. You can see that, that again the mud there. From there, we stopped and did a research station at about 8,000 feet, going up into crossing over the border out of Paraguay into, or after crossing the border from Paraguay into Argentina. So sort of in the middle of Argentina, climbing up to about 18 or 8,000 feet, we stopped. The teams worked 24 to 36 hours overnight in shifts again and built another research station in that area. It also was good to acclimate to altitude because 8,000 feet is a good mountain climbing stopover point to let yourself acclimate a bit because we ended up going quite a bit higher than that. Um, you can see the Andes back there in the background and the vehicles off in the distance, flat, desolate. We drove for, I think, three days at one time and I didn't see anything alive, not a bug, a plant, a leaf, a blade of grass, nothing. It's like a Mars scape. It's pretty cool there. That is not water back there. That's a mirage. You always hear about the mirages out in the desert. It was really a, a look like a lake in the background, so pretty cool. That's the road going up to the peak that, that I mentioned about getting up to altitude, because the pass that we went through um, was at 4895 meters. That's a little over 16,000 feet. And during this event, going through the Chaco, all of that, during the uh, 94 event, I had eight flat tires on our video car. And we one of those flat tires was happening as we were up there. And the last thing I wanted to do was change a tire at 16,000 feet. So we didn't stay there very long. We got down a ways and then and then changed that. So you have all the stuff with you to, there are two type tires, but the thorns sometimes were six inch long thorns. So what you'd have to do is get the tube out of the tire and then inspect the inside of the tire to make sure you got the thorn out of it that had punctured it in the first place. So, I got very good at repairing tires. And that's the whole, uh, when the rest of the, all of the teams got to the top, also a big celebration. They also took a lot of journalists up there, and that's just kind of a view from the top out over the Atacama. The Atacama is an amazing place. These are cool things that most of us could never do on our own. It took a big group with a lot of money behind it to get the permits to be able to do this and the safe to be able to do it safely. And so I feel really fortunate to have been involved with this. Um, there's my video crew of what we did and what was cool about it is we'd be at the back of the convoy and then they'd say, we need to be at the front of the convoy. So that was pretty fun to be able to kind of let things let things fly a bit and have a little bit of fun with it. Because here's some of the shots that we got out in the Atacama Desert of the convoy going through it. 
and you can see all the vehicles off in the, off in the distance. Some of this dust, if, you, if the wind wasn't blowing sideways at all, if it was just stationary, the dust was so deep as you drove, it would billow over the front of the car. The tires would push it forward just like a powdered sugar and it would push it over the car and you couldn't see anything. You just have to go slow and wait till it cleared enough to be able to see, to see again. And you, you can see some of that there. They also took a bunch of journalists from Argentina, the Argentina side, over the top and out to the coast and at Antofagasta where we finished. And as the journalists, a lot of them were on oxygen at the top of the, the top of the mountain because they hadn't stayed at, at the 8,000 foot level and worked for a couple of days. So they weren't really ready for that. So a lot of them were keeling over and on oxygen. So it's kind of cold. <laughs> As you um, cross over, even though there's places in the in the Atacama that hasn't rained since the 20s, so we're talking over 100 years ago, but as you get up there higher, there's the coastal influence where the moisture will actually push in even though there's no rain, and there's a lot of wild llamas around in the region. It was pretty cool seeing those whole different whole different world, and you can start to see the vegetation there. And that's it. Um, this takes us to, I want to mention, for any of you who ever go to the UK, and there's, I've got more slides here if we want to just put it on slides and let it play. I don't want to talk about all this. But there's a really couple of cool places in, in Coventry in the UK. The Classic Car Works does complete restorations of Jaguars and Land Rovers, and this is all on the historic vehicles. So if you're a customer, mm -hmm you can come in and have your vehicle work, or if you're an owner, you can have you come in and have your vehicle worked on, or you can actually purchase vehicles from there. You can look it up, Classic Car Works in Coventry, and they've got a great website on it. There's a bunch of pictures. We can flip through a couple of them. I'll just show them to you. This is the Series 1 that they found. It was one of the first three prototypes. They just found it a few years back. We were over there on a training, and they, had, they weren't sure what they were going to do with it, whether they were going to do a patina restoration, a full restoration. They chose ultimately to do kind of a patina restoration on it. And they have it driving now. You can, look, you can look it up. This was from about four or five years ago when we were over there. Um, that gentleman's from South Africa. He leads the training school in South Africa. Tons of cool vehicles in there. We'll jump forward a little bit real quick here. XJ220, 220 mile an hour uh, Jaguar, lots of cool stuff there. One of the most iconic vehicles in the world. With the interior, some of examples of those out here. I'm getting to somewhere and then we'll stop. Um, the engine on those, that engine was developed in secret during World War II, by the way. Had almost a 45 year production run. The Jaguar factory was shut down, they were rebuilding aircraft parts. And, and manufacturing aircraft parts, but they started working on an engine because they knew at the end of the war they would need something. So that had almost a 45-year production run. Double overhead cam, Hemi pistons, um, inline six, center spark plugs on it, header exhaust, side draft carburetors, 1945. So kind of cool when that was built. Saw some examples of that out here today, which was kind of neat to see. Uh, there's one of the full restorations. You'll notice the drip pan underneath of it. Full restoration. <laughs> and there's what they call a patina restoration. Mechanically sound, but stabilize the patina with, with top coats so it will continue to look like it did. Look kind of cool. Um, these were built for the Judge Dredd movies. It's actually a forward control. Land Rover rebuilt, I think, 31 of them, um, or built them for the movie. It was kind of fun. Forward control, built for the military from 72 to 78. Um, the 101-inch 100, forward control was never sold to civilians, but a lot of them ended up in civilian hands after the fact. So. 
that's a, a glimpse into the back end where we weren't supposed to take any pictures. <laughs> customer cars were there, but they said, it's okay, take a few. Um, this is where they actually store it. So this long row goes a long ways, and it's four rows deep, two vehicles high. So this is the back end of it where they store a lot of historical vehicles. And you can see in the foreground the CX-75 Jaguar. I put this picture in there because this is the first, and I know this is about Land Rover, but this is kind of cool because this is the first, an example of the first vehicle that Jaguar ever produced, the Swallow 7. Yep. And this is an actually a 1930 version of it. The first one came out in 1927. I had no idea how small these were, so I stood next to it to kind of give it context for size. They're tiny. If you think about Europe at, the, at that point, really narrow roads, so the cars were much smaller. There's the CX-75 microturbines, gorgeous car. I wish that would have been built. They determined that it was too good, too expensive. $700,000, I think, was the build price of that vehicle. So they said, yeah, we're not building that. It was during the Ford years, Ford really didn't understand the Jaguar brand. They did good things for us, but they didn't understand the brand. And what you might not be able to see from the back, that's a classic Range Rover, but it says Velar on the back of it. And so we'll, we'll stop with this slide, because Velar, as you know, is now in the, land, in the Range Rover fleet, it's in the family, but what they did when they built the Range Rover before it ever went public, instead of putting the hiding it, they hid it in plain sight. Velar in Latin means to veil or hide. So they did look kind of clever. They hid the vehicle in plain sight, didn't put Land Rover on it, just wrote Velar on the back of it. So when somebody saw it out there on the road, they go, what's a Velar? So that's, that's kind of cool. And with that, I think I'll just, we can stop there. There's a bunch more images, but check out the classic car works in Coventry. There's a lot of cool stuff there. It's online. You can look, you can check it out. If you ever make it to the UK, there's, there are several museums in Coventry and it's worth a stop there. A lot of good stuff there. So, all right, with that, I'll let you get on.